Um, welcome everyone to another ANS webinar event. It's a pleasure to have you all here online from near and far as part of the, the greater ANS uh, webinar series, which today have included topics such as data management, data licensing, data citation, to name but a few. My name is Alexander Hayes and I have with me here on this sunny Canberra day, Jerry Ryder, research data analyst from at Anne's, who's flown all the way from Fair Adelaide. <laughs> Welcome everybody. South Australia to join us for this important event. And of course, a myriad of meetings that she's doing. Here. Welcome, Jerry. Uh, for your interest, everyone, and to acknowledge the significance of this webinar topic, uh, it's important to note that we've got attendees registered for this webinar from the University of Canterbury, New Zealand, University of Tasmania, the Australian Antarctic Division, the University of Edinburgh, Chair Sciences Australia, La Trobe University, University of Canberra Australia, Deakin University, University of Melbourne Australia, Wiley Publishers, University of Western Sydney, Griffith University, University of Queensland, uh, Research Data Storage Infrastructure, RDSI, Monash University, and that's just to name a few. But a few of these organisations, it's obviously for to whom data's publishing is of great interest and an already an integral part of their research activities. So we've got very two distinguished guests today joining us today who are we're privileged to have on board, given that the topic at hand is data journals. Jane Smith is the Sherpa Service Development Officer at the Centre for Research Communications, University of Nottingham. In this role, Jane's involved in a number of projects around open access information, including Romeo, the Juliet Open Door, Fact and Jord. And those of you who have been involved in institutional publications and repositories, you'll be familiar with at least some of these acronyms. Jane's here today to talk about the Jord project, the Journal Research Policy Data Bank, which has a particular focus on journal publishers data sharing policies. We also have with us Dr. Fiona Murphy, who is the publisher for Earth and Environmental Sciences, Sciences Journals at Wiley working with a number of titles, societies, and other publishing partners. Uh, Fiona is also increasingly involved with emerging initiatives that promote good management practices of research data, including reuse, uh, use, citation, and linking from primary publications. Among other activities, uh, this has led to being a core partner in the prepared project on peer review and publication of data sets, and to membership of the STM Association, Association Research Data Group and World Data Systems Data Publication Working Group. Now for a very brief background on ANS activities. During late 2012, ANS staff undertook a, a desktop survey to identify data journals across a range of disciplines in order to define what a data journal is, to review data journal policies in particular, looking at requirements for DOIs, data deposit and data citation, as well as to assess the status of data journals surveyed, taking into account years established peer review processes and whether they're indexed in fact by Thomson Reuters Web of Science. So we're pleased today to be able to bring together these lead international initiatives and these guest speakers in a webinar that will sure will shed some light on the policies devised by academic publishers to promote linkage between data journals and journal articles and underlying research data. I'd like, now I'd like to introduce to you Jane Smith from the University of Nottingham. Yeah. Hopefully everyone can see um, the presentation appearing. Oh, here are, um, I've been working on the uh, General Research Data Bank, uh, Data Policy Bank, or JORD for simplification. Um, it was just before I was talk about what was uh, how, what happened to the, the, the project and findings. Just to give a bit of background, I'm sure you're all quite familiar with it if you're tuning into the ANS uh, webinars, but you just bear with me. Um, data has been becoming an increasingly valuable resource in its own right. Um, people are wanting access to the data behind journals, not just the data in the journal article. So, uh, so they're wanting to access the data sets. Research councils are now wanting uh, that publicly funded research data to be made more available and shared across the communities, uh, as much as an indication that they're spending their money appropriately. Um, and with changes in research practice and technology, it's now possible to make use of these data sets and collect different data sets for different researchers and 
and extract additional information uh, sort of across the board. As I'm sure you're aware, um, I think it's 2011, ANS had an international workshop, um, and part of this came out the conclusion that it would be a good advantage to collect journals' policies on research data, what the journals and the publishers want the, the authors to do with that data. So JISC, which is what, who funded JORD, uh, through the Managing Research Data Programme, so incorporated this idea into it um, and um, <coughs> asked for uh, people to, to bid to look at doing a feasibility study of, is, is this actually sensible sort of to do? Other aspects of the programme, including uh, making research data management uh, programs and management strands in various institutions, so there's a bit more of an infrastructure to be developed. And if the institutions are developing, asking the researchers to deposit data, they're going to start at wanting to know what the journals will let them do. So in some ways, uh, we've been calling it somewhat short and cheekily as the uh, Romeo for data to help people understand. So Jordan's six months feasibility study. Uh, it ran in July, December last year. As I said it was commissioned by JISC and it was run by Centre for Research Com Communications, uh, Research Information Network. Our colleague Paul Sturge is at the University of Loughborough that's just down the road from Nottingham and Mark Ware Consulting. And together we scoped and shaped a potential service that could provide uh, ready source information for covering journal policy landscape of research data. So we did this in three stages. Oh, sorry. I I need to have my notes in the right order. Our aims <laughs> uh, was to identify the scope and format of a service to collate and summarise general data policies, but also to investigate and recommend business models, uh, because we just wanted the aim that it would be financially self-sustaining. So those key stages I mentioned. First, we wanted to investigate what was the current state of journal policies on research data. Are there any out there? How good are they? What do they cover? That sort of thing. We also wanted to consult with stakeholders. I'm not just talking about researchers, but the research managers, the funders, the publishers, uh, the support work people sort of behind, who support the researchers, like librarians and repository staff. And as mentioned, we want to look at the business models and what service options are available. Yeah. So the, the literature review. Um, I want to look at what uh, what had been done already in the literature. Had anyone done something similar? Did they have any recommendations on how to do the studies and things like that? So, in summary of the literature review, general thoughts was there wasn't a great deal of literature on this area, particularly on journal policies or research data. There might be stuff about research data, but not necessarily about journals having policies. However, there were some key studies, and these found a large percentage of journals lacked policies and data sharing. And those studies are the likes of uh, McCain in 95 and perhaps more famously Pirouin and Chapman in 2008. Uh, I don't have the full references, but I can get them to people if they wish. There's also no standard procedures in, um, sort of across these, from these studies that indicated how, how a journal should create a data sharing policy and what those policies should advise. As my expected as a result of this, there's a large degree of degree of inconsistency. Um, some were very vague, some were very clear and cut of what was wanted. There's also little guidance available to the authors. However, some subject areas, like biomedical science, was leading the way in this area. And also, sort of as a perhaps, perhaps because of little guidance, researchers' data sharing habits were also quite inconsistent. So with this knowledge, we went to start looking at uh, what policies the journals actually have. And we decided to look at um, what were the highest and lowest impact factor journals and to pick 100 of each of these from the two subject areas covered by the Thomson Reuters Citation Index, so that's Science and Social Sciences. However, as you notice, we only actually looked at 371. This is because there's actually some duplication across these two lists. Um, of those 371 titles we investigated, um, 162, which is 44%, actually had policies. In fact, there were 230 policies, which 
I'll explain a bit later, but it does make sense. But this is quite a good subject to cover. There's 36 subject areas covered across these uh, two lists. We did consider whether or not to contain uh, journals we knew had policies in, but decided at the end to remove these because um, that could give a bit of bias and we didn't actually know where they sat on an impact factor scale. So this is a graph of who had policies. As you can see, the majority of the journals we looked at had no policy. We have some listed as unknown, um, and that's really where we were unable to find a journal website, so we couldn't find it if they had a policy. And we decided not to go, uh, go for direct contact with the journal editors due to the time scale of the project. However, there were several with multiple policies for the uh, journals, about 15%. And this would be where there might be a policy on data sharing, there might be a policy on data preservation, there might be a policy on sort of the formats of the data. And so it was actually the, the multiple policies, uh, the, the pol data policy was spread across multiple policies of the journal. We used Pirwan Chapman's uh, definition of strong and weak policies, uh, which in summary is where strong policies where data to deposit is the condition of publication. For example, if you don't deposit it, you can't publish. Whereas a weak policy would merely suggest or recommend the deposit. Based on this, of the journal policies we found, nearly three quarters were weak, with only a quarter being strong. Perhaps, again, not too surprising, the high impact journals were more likely to have a strong policy, and the lower impact journals were more likely to be just uh, recommend or suggest that authors share data. However, again, as indicated in our literature review, approaches varied between subject disciplines. Uh, with some more established than others. We did, in fact, notice, in addition to biomedical sciences, some of the um, some of the uh, chemical structure journals had more established practices. So, in addition to finding out whether they had a policy, we also wanted to know what was in that policy. So, we looked at data types, and with this, uh, we're looking. Basically, what, what what type of data do they want, us, want the author to deposit? Most of the time, we found it was data sets, multimedia, other data, fairly general terms, quite important in terms of data sets, but general, with uh, very few asking for specific types of data. But those that did were actually things like program code or protein and crystal structure to be deposited somewhere. We looked at where they're asking to deposit. Uh, the greater percentage of the policies we looked at requested materials were put on a website, fairly general again, or just the journal's own website. However, when we did some stakeholder consultation, it was revealed that a lot of the publishers were actually quite keen on well-managed subject repositories, but few were actually specifying then in their journals to do so. We then looked at when was looking at deposit. This is again quite inconsistent across the policies. 23% um, of the policies we looked at uh, asked the data to be made available for peer reviewers, uh, but not necessarily available to the readers after that point. 51% uh, uh, mentioned actually depositing alongside the article. And with some of these percentages, they might be ticking several of the sort of requirements. They might ask for reviewers and to be deposited later and available. So more interesting. At least one journal did allow the inclusion of an institutional website URL uh, as an endnote to the sort of articles, as long as it was a statement there that said the data hadn't been peer reviewed and maybe updated. It did allow for that tying in of the data, the background data to the article. Regarding sanctions, very few, but only 22 of the policies we found, uh, were made any indication that if you didn't deposit the data, you might not be published. So we decided to look at consulting uh, stakeholders, and these were really across the board: uh, scholarly publishers, research funders, research administrators, repository staff, library staff, and the researchers themselves. And we wanted to look at how they currently share data. Do they agree with the idea? Um, do they have any concerns about sharing data? Would they use a service listed journal uh, data policies? And for those that are relevant, would they be interested in assisting with this upkeep? 
So we conducted uh, 23 deep in-depth interviews, and these were mainly with sort of publishers, libraries, support staff. Uh, we also had a focus group of researchers and a workshop with publishers. Then we did an online survey that was directed at researchers again. And across this, it's found a complex situation where different stakeholder groups make some assumptions about each other's views and what the, their actions. Um, however, majority did support making data open and listed quite a few benefits of doing so. Uh, for example, preserving data for the future, promoting knowledge, reducing fraudulent claims, and, and like enabling the data to be scrutinized by the community. However, there were some concerns and barriers and caveats. The researchers were concerned about who would own the copyright to the data. Would the data be available in a form that, that it could be valuable to share? A spreadsheet of numbers might not make any sense to another researcher. Do they need another layer or sort of basic analysis before it can be shared? And in some cases of the researchers, particularly early careers researchers, they were concerned that making the data available before they've submitted their PhD could mean their PhD was worthless. So, just to give some of the th three of the main groups and some of their sort of comments. Researchers, they indicated they're quite, they thought a, a journal policy bank would be quite valuable because it allowed them to access whether a particular journal policy fits their form of data or data sharing ethos or the requirements of their funders. And it can be a point of reference of accessing other researchers' data. The librarians and repository staff, those with a history of librarianship had uh, maybe not so much knowledge about curating data, but they had similar experience with curating uh, journal and monographs collections and thought this, this knowledge could be transferred. However, in spite of this potential, there wasn't much happening. Um, in the UK, since sort of that stakeholder management, the, the same GISC programme has resulted in several research data management programmes at the various institutions taking part. So that, that picture may be changing. However, they thought the librarians did think that a policy bank would be quite val valuable. Um, it would enable them to support and develop research data management at their institution and would help them gain information and provide publication guidance to the researchers that were interested. Now, publishers, obviously, uh, wanted to look at what they thought. They thought that the audience for George was a little bit unclear. Was it researchers? Was it the publishers? Was it the librarians? Uh, however, they thought that an accessible list of information on data policies could be fun useful for the funders and policy staff and authors themselves but especially for researchers to ensure compliance with funders and institutional demands. So some sort of summaries of the stakeholder consultation. All of the stakeholders recognise the importance of linking between journal content and underlying data, particularly where data is stored in subject-based repositories. There's consensus about the importance of making data as freely available. How is a less unified approach about actually doing so in practice? Um, so some of the common features uh, that came out of the stakeholder conversation of what should be in a George service. There's quite a wide ranging specification and requirements, and if you listed them all together, they're going to be quite hard to, to satisfy everyone fully. However, these are sort of the five common features that came out. We wanted clear, automated and simple instructions on the service. Clear documentation on the service's aims, its policies and procedures. They wanted to know for the journal policies, they wanted to know what the conditions of deposit were, would they be able to reuse, how to access, and any restrictions on the data. They wanted guidelines for recommended file and data types and metadata, policy wording, sort of how to write the policies. And they wanted to know where the data could be archived. Almost 80% of our respondents to our online survey, which targeted researchers, answered they would, would use such a centralised service that records the data sharing policies of academic journals. So there certainly was interest in the service. But the big thing is, can it be self-sustainable? So we, uh, having uh, my colleagues developed a potential, based on the stakeholder consultation, some three basic uh, services, and then market tested it, spoke to the stakeholders, which were they more interested in. So the first one, suggested was a very basic service. The minimal web interface would have a 
excuse the acronym, an API, an application programmer's interfaces, which would allow machine-to-machine -machine interaction with the database. But it wouldn't be much more than that. The second was an enhanced service, so it would be the same as the basic, but there'd be additional data integration. So uh, it would link through to, to compliance with funder policies, possibly institutional policies, and it may list recommended repositories for the deposit. Lastly, there was a advisory service, it would be the same as enhanced, but on top of this would be a more advisory um, guides, best practice for writing policies, policy frameworks, and policy language suggestions. In general, the stakeholders preferred the one of the one either of the first two. Um, however, when it came to speaking to budget holders, although they were quite positive the idea, um, this on the sort of uh, research management side, uh, they were less keen on uh, providing the funding. They were, didn't think they could persuade the organisation it was that this was sufficient benefit enough to want the funding. Conversely, the publishers were quite keen on funding, but they wanted a lot more in the service that actually would possibly make it impractical to start off. However, based on this, uh, these three services options and stakeholder computations, a full business case was submitted to GISC as part of the feasibility study. A quick summary of the findings of the project. Regarding data sharing, it was felt that this was, this was quite an interesting subject. Um, it was certainly a growing area. There are funders developing, sorry, publishers developing data-only journals, and a rough guide from some previous studies of uh, McCain in '95 and Pirouard and Chapman in 2008. Bearing in mind the different population sizes, there did appear to be an increased number of policies each time people looked at it. So it's certainly an increasing area. However, when it comes to actually sharing information, there's a lot more floor uptake. Researchers uh, were perhaps more likely to share with their immediate colleagues, but not necessarily the colleagues on the other side of the country or the other side of the world. Again, similar reasons down to uh, the hypothetical PhD student mentioned before. The concern that other people would trump them in publications. The policies that did exist. Uh, it's had a slight possible slight increase in this uh, this area, but they were still uh, generally poor, not very clear, and they were they were missing in some subject areas. The general support for a George service, uh, uh, but the, the requirements differ between research and publishing communities. So, uh, although there's some five common features, it, there could be some issues of, of how to go about. It. However, the uh, data is in an increasing area, so a George service could benefit the future in this area. And it could help build while the numbers of policies are smaller, a bit better than all the discussion, and build now. So George recommended to JISC uh, a two-phase study, or two-phase uh, procedure to go ahead. Phase one would be grant funded and it would build a simple service, focusing on getting the, an, a good data set of the policies uh, with simple technology, and then use that to build engagement with stakeholders, build awareness, establish a need for the service. And there could still be that machine-to-machine -machine interface with third parties creating applications on top of it, and also to further develop the self-sustaining model. Phase two would implement the self-sustaining model um, and there might be a need for some additional funding uh, before breaking even, but there could also be uh, opportunities for grant funding, research and development activities. So some final thoughts on what we found for the George survey. George service. Uh, the user base for um, a George policy bank would probably mainly be people and service that work within and support the research community. A lesser number of users would be publishers and funding bodies. Uh, so representatives acknowledges some there's some use for collation of the journal data policies that could be found. Such a service could provide easy access to journal data policies, provide clarity on when, where, and what to deposit, provide guidance on file and metadata formats, and help librarians and support staff to enable researchers. 
as I mentioned, there's currently a small number of policies available. We're talking in the hundreds, uh, if we take into account previous studies. So building a George type service would be much simpler and likely to be built sturdily if done now. And would enable the introduction of good practice now before the policy numbers increase dramatically and no one has an idea what <laughs> to do with them. So at the moment we're waiting a decision from JISC on how to take the George concept further as they consider our feasibility study. So my recommendation to you is get involved in research data. If your institution has a research data management plan, get involved. If it hasn't, encourage the powers that be that it's a good idea. So, uh, so that's a few references uh, there in, in short. As I said, I can provide them in full if required. So if there's any questions. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, and having done a very small desktop survey of um, journal data policies, I um, applaud the rigour of the work that was done by George and, and re recognise it was no small task.